Battleground Productions presents Brass, the audio serial. Episode 10, Grave Matters. The year is 1885, but not one that would be familiar to you. For this is a 19th century that differs in many ways from the one in our history books. For while the gambling pits of our London feature any number of illicit combats between roosters, ratters, and pugilists, they never featured as bizarre pair of combatants as Gwendolyn Brass and a mechanical bear, a lumbering, shuddering, grinding monster who even now is closing in on our friend. All right, Gwendolyn. No need to panic. A quick weapons inventory. One small derringer, one stiletto blade, one pair of brass knuckles, one garrote. And in that corner, one mechanical bear weighing approximately a hundred stone, with claws the size of ten penny nails and teeth the size of my shoes. Oh, the garrote's right out. No good on that one. It's not the swiftest of creatures, though. If there was anywhere to run. Vincent Law said there's an off switch somewhere. Though he might be lying. He's probably lying. But since it's mechanical... Whoa! He's ready to charge. It has to have an engine, and that engine has to have a battery. Oh, the chest! Oh. Or perhaps not. Come on, you beast, where's your power source? And here he comes again. Oh! Oh! Good thing for my reinforced corset. At least I got an eye. And I'm afraid a one-eyed bear doesn't seem to be anything more than greatly ticked off. As the creature of pistons, cogs, and armored plating lowers its head, Gwendolyn slowly backs towards the wall, anticipating its charge. Oh dear. I don't suppose playing dead will do much good. And I'm quite sure being dead will do even less. Huh? Ah! <laughs> Yet even as their only daughter faces death by artificial ursine, Lord and Lady Brass are approaching the west entrance of Highgate Cemetery and a rendezvous which they hope will give them entrance into the court of the Graveyard King. How do these teeth look, Madeline? Smile and let me see. Ridiculous, Benjamin. Take them out. But they change the shape of my face. Yes, by making you look like a ferret. To my mind, Darby Peacham has a certain ferret-like quality. Nonsense. Darby is a scarpering rogue, but if he looked like a ferret, why would Molly stay with him? True love. Oh, really, Benjamin? If you won't put the time into creating a coherent backstory for your disguise. All right, all right. If Molly Peachin prefers her husband to have the straight and perfect teeth of a matinee idol. Oh, so you've another set of false teeth you were looking to try out. Come here, my lysome wench. Don't go mussing my makeup. I am particularly proud of my co smudges. All right, then. So why do you think that the Graveyard King has moved his base of operations to Highgate Cemetery? There have been several reports of spectres and ghosts on the grounds in the last few months. What sort? All sorts. Spectral bells, mysterious ladies in white, even a phantom carriage. Clearly all nonsense. How can you be sure? Oh, really, Benjamin? Have you suddenly gone all spiritualist on me? There are more things, my love, in heaven and earth. Or have you already forgotten our duel with the mad fakir of Bihar? Of course I haven't. And are you saying that what we experienced in the caves of Marabar is fully explicable in terms of scientific explanation? Of course. Dear husband, we both drank the peddler's tea, and I still maintain that it was drugged. As if that explains anything. What we experienced for the next six hours was merely a very elaborate hallucination. A collective hallucination. Very well, collective. What should I believe otherwise? That certain Hindu deities not only engaged us in conversation... A highly intriguing conversation. One that for me at least had lasting philosophical implications. But somehow these same deities apparated our physical forms from underground to the surface. And what is your explanation? Clearly, we made our way out of those caves through more mundane means. Even if all that is true, the Fakir was not the first time we have faced the supernatural. The monster of Glams, the little men of Hudson Valley, the fearsome Wendigo of the Canadian backwoods. Malformation due to inbreeding, genetic dwarfism combined with a fearsome alcoholic distillation, and mass hysteria following a bear attack, respectively. Spring-Hill Jack? Well? 
simply not enough evidence to make any rational conclusion. Ha! That luminescent corona about his form, it seems to argue some electrical apparatus when we next see him. If we ever do. Perhaps your new assistant, Mr Tesla, will have some suggestions. Nikolai Tesla is hardly my assistant. The man's genius humbles me. Then it's the first thing I've ever heard of that does so. I'm serious, Madeline. The man understands electricity like no one I've ever met. Do you know what he was telling me about this afternoon? What? He has become convinced that it is possible to carry sound and even the human voice across the ether without any wires or other physical component. Voices out of the air? That sounds like young Mr. Tesla has a predilection towards the spiritualists himself. More things on heaven and earth. You need to increase your stock of Shakespeare quotes, Benjamin. Now, to the business at hand. Let's review what we know of this cemetery. I really didn't have any time to do any substantial research at all. Oh, really? The way you rushed us out the door this evening, how could I? Then we know almost nothing. Really? All I know off the top of my head is that Highgate Cemetery was established in 1839, is 37 acres in size, was designed by architect Stephen Geary and is famous for its Egyptian avenue in the Circle of Lebanon, a picturesque crescent avenue of vaults. I see. Nothing else? Nothing really, except that illustrious residents include George Eliot and her husband, several of Dickens' family, and my second cousin, Wallace de Vere, died of yellow fever in 1867. I don't think I've ever met him. Not much of a loss. A failed ornithologist. How does one fail at ornithology? By misidentifying one too many birds. Well, then, what else do we know of the Graveyard King's base of operation? When we met him five years ago, he was operating out of the Abney Park and Tower Hamlet cemeteries exclusively. But now I have been told that he's expanded his operations to all seven of London's great cemeteries. The same old games of grave robbing and picking pockets at funerals? Apparently so. Yet I believe there's more to this. Last year, while we were away, Parliament enacted something called the Disused Burial Grounds Act. What was it designed to do? There was some sort of commotion when a developer purchased a piece of property that was an abandoned graveyard off of Borough High Street. When word got out that he had plans to build on top of the graves... Public outcry resulted in legislation making such transactions illegal. Eminently reasonable legislation from the sound of it. I agree, and yet... Rumours abound that it was not only for the public good, but for the special interest of one man. The Graveyard King. Yes. I don't know what advantage there might be in having former graveyards left undeveloped throughout the city, but perhaps we will find out. Wait. Someone's coming to the gate. And who might you two be? Molly and Darby Petram is who we are, and we've come to pay our respects to the Graveyard King. Oh, you have, have you? Well, you're several years too late. He's dead and buried. He might be buried, but he's far from dead, unless a dead man's offering good wages for night work. It might be that someone of my acquaintance is hiring. No names as to who, man. Have you the proper offering for consideration? Ah, perhaps this is all ticket now. Here now, coachman. You have a delivery? I do, from St. Bart's. Grave digger, can you open the gate so we can bring it in? No need. If that's what is advertised, you've been given your first mission. Which is? Transported from here to Kensal Green. Why? Do you start your probationary employment by asking the why and wherefore up front? Sorry, of course. Driver, let's be on our way. Not in that vehicle. We have other transport providers. Oh, my. What is that? It's the Graveyard King's latest addition to his fleet. A steam hearse. Impressive. Indeed it is. Horseless, with an enclosed cabin providing privacy for the grieving relations and a rear deck capable of carrying three coffins at once. Three coffins? In case of epidemics or disasters or the like. What's with that coachman? There's something not quite right about him. He's mechanical. Does punch in the instructions and where you need to go 
and it gets you there infallibly. Now, you two, go ahead and get in the carriage. Me and this fellow will load up the coffin. Now climb aboard. It's certainly well upholstered. I don't like this, Benjamin. Why? It's all come together too neatly, and too few questions have been asked of us. We've got the box in, already in there, and off you go. Give our regards to the Graveyard King. I must say, if one has to attend a funeral, this will be a stylish conveyance. All of this ridiculous pomp around death. You do not think death a personage to be respected? I think of him as a personage to be avoided at all costs. Do you hear that? I do. What do you think it is? It seems to be coming from the general area of the coffin, which is somewhat disconcerting. Somewhat. Good evening, mes amis. By now you are, I hope, comfortable in the recesses of my steam house. It's him. You may be regretting your decision, but I assure you, there's little you can do now. A recording, I think. The doors to the carriage are, of course, locked and reinforced. Now, seeing you are both quick-thinking and observant people, you will have noticed two other things. That the engine is increasing in speed, and that there is an erratic knocking coming from the coffin in the back. Intolerable Frenchman. To the second matter, the knocking comes from Dr. Stamford, late of St. Bart's Hospital, who you asked to supply you with a corpse. Stamford is currently acting as a substitute for the corpse. At this point, however, he is still alive. The fiend! And to the first, the increasing speed of my steam house is the result of an unfortunate design flaw in the vehicle. It has a tendency that, if unchecked, causes the boiler to hypercharge, leading to an increase in velocity and an eventual explosion. I thought this was a dubious foreign manufacture. Now that you're on your merry way down Swain's Lane, I foresee one of two potential outcomes. Death from boiler explosion, or death from collision. Not bloody likely. Of course you may protest, and no doubt are working even now on the door locks, which you'll find are très complex. He's right about that. But can even you, Lord and Lady Brass, not only escape a hurtling death machine, but manage to do so without sacrificing the life of an innocent man? Well, can you? Goodness! As the ebony black steam carriage hurtles through the night with increasing speed, things do indeed look perilous for our heroes. And even if they can manage to somehow leap off the conveyance, how can they possibly manage to save the life of Dr. Stamford, nailed shut in a wooden coffin? And what of Gwendolyn, facing a murderous machine and mechanical mayhem? Not to mention Cyril, still trapped in a theatre overrun with criminals and in the darkness with a mysterious phantom. Find the answers to these and other questions next season when we rejoin the first family of the realm, Brass. Brass is manufactured by Battleground Productions. For credits and more information on our show, go to battlegroundproductions.org and find us on Facebook.